Hey, real quick, this video is part two of my Japan story series. So if you want the full context for the stuff I'll be discussing here, I suggest watching part one first. Link is in the description. Okay, enjoy the video. I've had several jobs throughout my life. One of my first jobs was working as a gopher at a hair salon. I worked in food service for a bit and it was so terrible I made a video about it. I've worked several desk jobs and these days I'm a full-time comic artist, illustrator, artist alley vendor and YouTube person. But of all these, probably my most interesting job was being an English teacher abroad in Japan. I worked as an ALT, or assistant language teacher, on the JET program for two years, from the summer of 2017 to the summer of 2019. And though I didn't stay very long, the maximum length for a JET contract is five years, I still had a lot of fun doing it, and it was an extremely interesting and fulfilling experience. I've gotten a lot of questions asking me what my experience was like, and I have a feeling that some folks who apply for JET in the future are probably looking up videos and trying to see what the experience is like before applying. Because that's what I did. I watched like hundreds of JET blogs in the time leading up to sending in my application. So for today's video, and the second part of my Japan experience series, I wanted to talk about what my experience as an English teacher in Japan was like. The day-to-day, -day, the types of lessons I did, what my school was like, and some stories from my time there. So let's discuss. But before we dive into it really quick, let's do our usual, hey star, what you drawing? The art in the background is the stickers and print design for my webcomics July 2023 mail club set. The theme my Patreon supporters voted on was a mail and postal themed mail club, so expect some cute and aesthetically pleasing mail themed design. You can get this month's goodies by supporting my Patreon during the month of July. Link is down in the description. I mean, if you're not familiar with my webcomic, you can read it at castoff-comic.com. Link is also down below. Okay, let's get into it. So before we get into the nitty gritty details, let's first talk about how schools in Japan generally work. In the US, we typically have elementary school for first through fifth grade, middle school for sixth through eighth grade, and high school for ninth through 12th grade. However, in Japan, their elementary schools tend to be from first to sixth grade, middle school is from seventh to ninth grade, and high school is from 10th to 12th grade. So while high school in the States is typically four years, high school in Japan is only three. And I bring this up because during my time in Japan, I was a teacher at a high school. Now, when you join a program like JET, one of the things they really drill into your head is that everyone's job is going to be different based on their placement. What city you're in, how many schools you teach at, how much English your students are expected to know, etc. From my understanding, JETs who get assigned to elementary schools usually teach at multiple schools throughout the week, while middle and high school teachers tend to get assigned to one school and you're there all the time. Now, there were exceptions to this. I knew one ALT from my city who taught one day a week at a school for the visually impaired, for example. But for most high school ALTs, we were assigned to one particular school. And my school was interesting. So if you've watched anime before, you probably have like a general idea of some things you'd see and how things can usually work in Japanese high schools. Students wear uniforms and have a fairly strict dress code. You have a set of indoor shoes and outdoor shoes and lockers at the school's entrance where you can change shoes. Students are assigned a classroom and stay in that classroom for most of the day and the teachers go to that classroom for lessons, etc. And from my experience, that tends to be the case for most schools. My school, however, had none of that. So just throw all those expectations out the window. Goodbye and good riddance to you. My school was a special case in pretty much every regard. I heard it called an alternative school a few times while I was there. My students didn't wear uniforms. A lot of them had dyed hair and piercings. We didn't change shoes inside the buildings and students made their own schedules so they weren't tied to a single classroom for the entire day. It actually felt a lot more like a high school you'd see in the US, except it was also more like a community college. Okay, so most of the students I taught were high schoolers. I'd argue 90 to 95% of them were your average students. However, my school also had a program for older students. Folks in their late teens or early 20s, sometimes even as high as their 30s, who had dropped out of high school and were coming back to finish their degree. And we also had a small quantity of much older students mostly retirees who were bored and decided to take English lessons for fun. More on them later. We also had some students who only took classes half the day and our school also offered night classes. A lot of students either had difficult home lives or had to work during the day, so our school was really flexible to help accommodate those students. I'm pretty sure we also had e-learning classes, but I never taught those, so I don't know much about them. On top of all that, because of how flexible and accommodating the school was, we had a lot of students with things like learning disabilities, ADHD, social anxiety, etc. The kind of things that make going to a normal school more challenging. 
I mostly taught first years in my English classes, but I heard that we got a lot of second year transfer students because students would spend their first year at a more traditional high school, have a lot of trouble, and switch over to our school in their second year because it was more accommodating to their needs. After hearing all that, I imagine some of you are probably thinking, gosh, Star, your school sounds like a nightmare. And I definitely had those comments directed at me when I talked about my school to other ALTs. But in reality, it wasn't that bad. Maybe a little more difficult than your average high school, but most of the time it just meant being patient with students who were having a hard time, lots of positive reinforcement, making sure to speak slowly and clearly, and using lots of hand gestures and visuals to make myself easier to understand, and as well as tweaking my lesson plans a bit. See, because most Japanese high schools require you to take an entrance exam to get in, there's typically an expected level of English skill at your average school, and that expected level can vary pretty significantly depending on the school's focus. One school a friend taught at put a lot of emphasis on international communication, so most of his students were fairly fluent in English. I even helped out in an English-only summer camp at his school during summer break. And I had other friends whose high schoolers could barely string a sentence together. But at the very least, whatever the expected level of English was, that level of English applied to all of their students, and they could make lesson plans around the expected skill level. But again, my school was different. Some of my students were very good at English. I had a handful that I could have full conversations with entirely in English with no problem. And I had others that could barely say hello to me. And when the level of English proficiency varied that much, it could be really tricky to make lesson plans that could accommodate everyone's skill levels. Thankfully, most of my classes were divided up based on their relative English skills, though I had my higher level classes who I planned more difficult activities for, and my lower level classes who I had to go easier on. The circumstances of my school made things difficult at times, but after the first few months I got my sea legs and crafting lesson plans that accommodated for the different skill levels was like a second nature. So that's what my school was like. Now let's talk about what my job actually was. Like I said earlier, different ALTs will have different levels of responsibility depending on how much their school chooses to utilize them. I knew some people whose schools use them like a glorified tape recorder, basically just reading out of the textbook so students could hear things spoken by a native English speaker. And I knew some folks who were given a lot more responsibility and basically taught entire lessons by themselves. For me, I was somewhere in the middle. At my school, classes were about 90 minutes. The first half of classes would be taught exclusively by the JTE, the Japanese teacher of English, who would go through the textbook and teach the students their grammar points and lead a more traditional lesson. Then, during the second half, I'd bust in the back door of the classroom with the rolling TV cart and a PowerPoint and props and yell, OK, kids, who is ready to play Battleship with your vocab words? <laughs> See, at my school, my job was less about directly teaching students vocab and grammar and more about getting them to actually use their English and practice in fun ways that kept them engaged for the 50 minutes of my lesson, which meant playing a lot of games, doing a lot of activities, and generally keeping my lessons fun, light, and interesting. Their actual English teacher would teach them English, and I would help reinforce what they were learning with games and practice activities. And overall, it was a lot of fun. I apparently had a reputation among my students for being a bit of a ham. I liked to be a bit goofy during lessons and my teacher persona was very bubbly and excited to help try and get the students to loosen up a bit. I also got in the habit of making little mistakes in front of them to help them relax a bit, but that probably sounds a bit weird, so let me explain what I mean. When I started as a teacher, I basically knew zero Japanese. I knew a handful of phrases, but nothing that would actually be useful in conversation. I picked up more as I went along, but in general, I didn't speak Japanese to my students at all. But sometimes during lessons or activities, I had to use words they probably wouldn't know in English. So in those instances, I would usually include the English word with the Japanese word in parentheses next to it, and then try to pronounce the Japanese word during my presentation, and I'd usually botch it pretty badly. Or if we were playing a game and I had to write in Japanese for whatever reason, I would mess up the stroke order and they'd laugh at me and yell at me the right way to do it. Most of the time I'd know how to pronounce the word or how to write the kanji, but I'd make the mistakes on purpose. Why? Well, one of the hardest parts of learning a new language is getting over the fear of making mistakes or the fear of sounding stupid because you say the wrong thing or pronounce a word wrong. So if my students see that their teacher can make mistakes learning their language and everything is fine, that in turn helps make them more comfortable making mistakes themselves. After all, trying to speak English and making a mistake is a hundred times better than not trying at all. So yeah, my lessons were generally pretty fun, lighthearted, very focused on the students enjoying themselves and practicing with their new language. And 
like I said, they played a lot of games in my class. We played Battleship to practice sentence structure. Instead of a letter and a number for the X and Y coordinates, their X and Y would be the start and end of a sentence, focusing on whatever grammar point they were using. And they'd read out the sentence as their coordinates to play Battleship with their partner. We played Mario Kart in teams, where I'd ask a question or have the students write a sentence, and if they did it correctly, they could roll the dice and move their team's character forward on the track I drew on the blackboard. I also let them draw item cards to give themselves the boost or push back other teams and give themselves an advantage. Another fun one was teaching them how to play M.A.S.H. You know, the game we all played in elementary school where you predicted who you would marry, where you would live, what job you'd have, all that kind of stuff. Well, we played that to practice writing future tense. They'd go through, write in their answers, roll a die, then cross off the answers until only one remained in each category, then write out what their future will be like. I will live in an apartment. I will be a doctor. That kind of thing. One of my favorite activities for practice before their final exams was Jeopardy. The students would be divided into teams, and each team had a mini whiteboard. Each category was a different grammar point or English challenge they were expecting to be tested on, and they ranged in difficulty from 100 to 600 points. When a team would choose their category and number of points, I'd read out the problem, and each team would write the answer on their whiteboards. When time was up, they'd all hold up their whiteboards, and each team that got the answer right got points. For one of my more advanced classes, I even had a murder mystery lesson. I told the students that I had been killed, and they had to find the clues and figure out which of the other English teachers was the culprit. The clues were written on cards I hit around the room before class, and the students had to write down the clues and tick off each teacher's alibi in order to figure out who the killer was. Like I said, lots of games, lots of fun stuff. So I taught a few different classes at my school. Firstly was your typical English 1 class. Pretty basic, pretty standard stuff. Everyone at my school was required to take at least one year of English, so I taught pretty much every student at my school in their English 1 class. Class sizes were usually between 15 to 25 kids, and this is where I played most of the games I talked about just now. And these were also the classes that were divided up based on the skill level of the students. I taught a total of probably 10 of these a week, two or three a day on average, with my lower level classes in the first half of the week and my higher level classes in the second half. My next most common class was English Conversation, which is, again, exactly what it sounds like. This was a higher level English class that focused on speaking and conversational English. I taught a handful of these every week with average class sizes of 10 to 20. And these classes were where most of my adult students were. Remember earlier how I said I had a handful of older retiree students who were using their retirement to learn English? Well, they were known to take the same English conversation class over and over and over again so they could get more time to practice and speak with native English speakers, i.e. me. My adult students were always very nice and sweet, and their English was generally pretty good, so I could have nice conversations with them and often paired them with the younger high school students during activities so they could help the students out if they were struggling. But my adult students were also the ones who always asked the most difficult questions. There was usually a five minute break between the first part of their lessons and my part, and often they would use that time to chat with me and ask about American culture or English grammar. I remember one time I had to make a three circle Venn diagram to explain the difference between the words look, watch, and see, because in Japanese, it's all the same word. But in English, it's three separate words, and they're all used for different things. Like, you could say you want to watch a movie, or you're going to see a movie, but you wouldn't say you look at a movie. And it was these kinds of questions and struggling to answer them that made me kind of start to hate English. Nothing will make you realize how stupid your native tongue is like trying to teach it to someone who doesn't speak it natively. English has so much stupid nonsense that native English speakers never think about but it's all brought into sudden harsh contrast when you're forced to sit and explain it to someone who didn't grow up with the language. Now, to be fair, I feel like every language has its own stupid things. Japanese isn't a perfect language either. It's phonetic and the grammar is fairly easy to pick up. But then you take one look at kanji and you kind of want to die inside. And God forbid you try to count something. But I'm a mostly monolingual pleb and I taught English, which means I hate English now. English, why are you like this? Anyway, that's English conversation. Moving on. During the second half of the year, I also taught an English listening class. While English conversation focused mostly on speaking and writing, listening class focused mostly on verbal comprehension and critical listening skills. And this one was interesting. I had a hard time coming up with lessons at first until I and the teacher I taught with figured out that I could basically talk about whatever the heck I wanted and whatever the students were interested in hearing about that day. 
I usually did come in with a lesson, but during the break, I'd have conversations with the students and probably 50 to 75% of the time that conversation would end up taking the entire 50 minutes of class. They'd ask me a question over break and we'd get into these long drawn out conversations where I'd just talk about a random topic and they'd ask more questions and I'd go even deeper into the topic. And as long as they were listening and understanding what I was saying, that was technically what the class was for. I remember spending an entire class talking about how messed up and expensive American healthcare is and another class talking about cereal and what the average American meal looked like. It varied wildly and was usually dictated by whatever the students were interested in talking about that day. Wild, unpredictable, very fun on those long conversation days. I only taught one group of students per semester, but I taught them twice a week, so I got to know those students pretty well. Good class, fun class. The last class I taught was another fun one, cross-culture. This was my smallest class, usually only four or five students, and I only saw them once a week. This class was entirely about learning about other countries and cultures while also being considered an English class. Since I'm from America, I talked mostly about my experiences there and what life in the US was like and how it was different from Japan. But I also talked about other cultures when I could and when it was relevant. Usually I'd take whatever topic the JTE talked about in her segment of class and expand on it for mine, talking about different cultural aspects and playing games where I could. For example, in January, we did our New Year's lesson where I had them watch the Good Mythical Morning episode talking about New Year's traditions around the world and acting out the different traditions. And then my students would watch the video, match the tradition to the country on a worksheet, and then we'd have a discussion after. We did a lot of fun stuff like that. One of my favorite things I ever did for that class, though, was a lesson about international translation and localization. It started with my students, the JTE, and I having a random conversation about cartoons, and I casually brought up some of the changes made to the Sailor Moon and Pokemon anime when they were brought over to the US. And after that, the JTE asked me if I could make an entire lesson on the topic, which is how this photo ended up happening. Yes, I made a PowerPoint where I talked about the Pokemon rice ball jelly donuts thing. I think it's so funny I made a pin about it, shop link in the description. Anyway, so that's basically what I did for two years. Every weekday, I'd either walk or ride my bike to school, come in, sit at my desk in the teacher's room, make my lessons, make worksheets, go teach a class, come back, work some more, teach another class, lunch, one or two more classes in the afternoon, discuss tomorrow's lesson with the teachers I'd be working with the next day, and go home. That was my day-to-day -day for the two years I worked in my high school. There were, of course, special events during the year too. Our school didn't have a sports festival, but we did have a culture fest. I missed the prep for it both years because I had an ALT conference the days leading up to it, but the school festival was always on a Saturday, so I still got to go and see what all my students did for their homeroom activities. Ours wasn't as extravagant as some of the school festivals you might've seen in anime, but it was still fun and cute and the clubs did events and little concerts and things. I always made sure to bring lots of cash with me so that I could go around and buy stuff from the students selling things in their classroom. I remember one particular instance when one of my rowdier students ran up to me in the hallway yelling, Star Sensei, Star Sensei, uh, 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 bread, buy bread, please. And it was so cute, I let him drag me to his classroom and bought some of the little snacks they had for sale. My favorite one was the ceramics club. Every year they made little pots, planted cacti in them and sold them. And I always made a point to buy one each year and keep them on my work desk. I called them my cactus buddies. And then I had to leave them behind when I left and I was really, really sad about it. There were also a number of clubs doing exhibition. The art club had a gallery, the music clubs did concerts, and I found out our school had a biology club when I was invited to come see their exhibit with a bunch of giant rhino beetles and even got to pet one of the larval ones. Those things are freaking huge. I get why they're worth so much money in Animal Crossing because dang, yeah, they're really impressive up close. Aside from that, we had things like assembly days where classes were shortened or missed entirely, several long breaks throughout the year where I just wouldn't teach any classes at all, but I'd still have to come into school and stare at my desk all day. But I used that time to work on comic scripts, so eh -heh -heh. And then in spring was graduation. Because my school didn't have uniforms, a lot of my students actually ended up wearing kimonos for their graduation, which was really cool to see. The students and their families would get dressed up super nice and they'd walk on stage and get their diplomas and it was always really emotional. So as you might've guessed, being a teacher for a few years means I have a lot of fun stories from working at my school. And while I have enough of them to fill an entire other video on their own, to close out the video, here's the highlight reel of weird or interesting conversations I had at my teaching job. 
When I saw students in the hallway, they'd sometimes like to practice their English on me, usually just by yelling, ah, star sensei, good morning, and things like that. But one day I saw one of my rowdy students in the hall waved at him and said, good morning. And he just looked him in the eyes with this super serious look on his face and said, no, bad morning, and kept walking. <laughs> I assumed he was just tired or something, but I thought the conversation was so cute I told one of my JTEs about it and she got such a kick out of it that she started saying it too. It became our early morning vibe check. I would walk in and whether or not I was greeted with a good morning or a bad morning would set the tone for the rest of the day. <laughs> At one point in my listening class, we got on the topic of things about Japan that surprised me. And I said the first thing that came to mind, y'all put corn in everything. And seriously, they do. Like, I know Americans like corn. Hell, I enjoy corn a lot. I put it in my instant ramen all the time. But Japan seems to put corn in things you wouldn't expect corn to be in. I had corn on pizza, corn soup in a can from a vending machine. I even had corn sushi one time. Like we went to a revolving sushi restaurant and they had the corn mixed in with mayo and wrapped in nori. It was so weird. And yes, I ate it, it was actually pretty good. Anyway, we got to talking about corn for the next few minutes and I asked if they had ever seen blue corn before. And they said no, so I pulled up some pictures of blue corn on my phone to show them that yes, it is a real thing. And one student asked, ah, um, sensei, this is poison? And I just laughed and said, no, it's not poison, it's just blue. <laughs> I wanted to try and buy some blue corn chips for that class, but I didn't end up being able to, oh well. During my lessons, I would sometimes walk around and peek at the students' work to see if they needed help and make sure they were doing the projects correctly. And sometimes they doodle on their worksheets and it always made me really happy because I remember being a student and drawing in the margins of my notes and my worksheets. So whenever I caught somebody drawing, I would point at their little art and compliment them on it, usually just like, oh, cute. And they'd always get a little flustered. It was adorable. After a while though, some of them realized that I would do this pretty consistently. And sometimes they even drew me and it was so cute. And then I was the one who got flustered because oh my God, that's so freaking cute. I also had little catchphrases I like to use in class like nice energy or good English. And they'd always draw me saying the little catchphrases and it, it was so cute. I die, I'm dead, I'm deceased, it's too cute and I can't handle it. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to heaven now, I am dead, I have died. I would also sometimes comment if students had characters on things like their folders or binders or pencils, etc. Lots of students had little things like pencil cases and clear files with anime characters on them. And with some of my more outgoing students, if I recognized the anime, I'd point at their folder and ask, which character is your favorite? Sometimes followed by, is that one your boyfriend? Which usually got a laugh or an enthusiastic yes in response. My students and I are kindred spirits in this regard. I remember my high school anime boyfriends very well. <laughs> uh, related to that story, when we were doing the MASH activity I described earlier, one of my male students wrote down a bunch of Idolmaster character names for the I Will Marry section. And I, of course, being a big old Idolmaster fan, saw this and pointed it out. I said, oh, you like Idolmaster? Which character is your favorite? And he said he liked Chihaya. Good taste, bud, she's in my top three. I nodded and said, ah, I see. Makoto is my favorite. And he was so surprised that I knew what Idolmaster was. <laughs> surprised, dear student, I am, in fact, a big old idol anime nerd. Ha 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 ha. In one of my English classes one time, I was preparing for the lesson while my students were still on break, and one of the girls who sat up front got my attention and asked, Star Sensei, can you write like this? And just gesticulated wildly and made big loops like she was writing in the air with her hands. I stared at her for a couple seconds before I realized, oh, you mean like writing in cursive? And she nodded really excitedly. So I grabbed some chalk and wrote my name in cursive on the board which of course led to her and her gaggle of friends to ask me to write all their names in cursive too. And then they all took pictures of how I wrote it and they were trying to do it themselves later in class. It was really cute. <laughs> oh, but on a similar subject, something really interesting I learned is that apparently Japan used to teach English students how to write in cursive 
like, okay, all of my on-level high school students wrote in non-cursive, normal English letters, right? But all of my adult students, the one in their 60s and up, they all wrote in cursive. It was the weirdest thing. Fascinating, but weird. I mean, I learned how to write cursive when I was in elementary school, but after doing the cursive writing portion of my SATs, I'm pretty sure I never used cursive again. So it was super weird seeing a bunch of little old Japanese ladies writing in super nice cursive. And speaking of my adult students, who boy, I have a lot of stories about them. I remember being nervous about teaching older folks at first, but they were always super sweet and I warmed up to them really quickly. Plus, they were always a hoot to have in class. I remember one of the first activities in my English conversation class was a show and tell presentation. Each student brought in something important to them and explained why they liked it and what the significance was. A lot of students brought in things related to their hobbies or their interests, but one of my older students brought in a small bag of coins. And then his presentation was basically about how much he liked money. During another activity, we played a conversation game where the students had to ask and answer questions to each other. And one of the questions was, if you had one billion yen, about 10 million USD, what would you buy? And the same guy said, I would buy gold and bury it. No taxes. And I just, <laughs> was so good, oh my God. Now, I said earlier that I didn't use Japanese with my students unless I felt like I needed to, but sometimes I'd sprinkle in some of my mediocre Japanese for flavor. One time during an English conversation class, I was helping a student with an activity, and when they finally got the answer right, I said, yay, you did it right, yatta! And one of my adult students was sitting nearby. They gave me a cheeky look and said, Star Sensei, how do you know yatta? And I kind of laughed. I said, oh, well, you know, I've heard students say it and I've heard it in anime before. And he seemed to accept that answer. And I'm really glad he did because I didn't want to tell him the actual answer, which was that I originally learned that word from a song that was popular on YouTube when I was younger. And you know, that might be a little weird to explain. I always got into really interesting conversations in my cross-culture class. Since the class was so small, we were usually pretty casual and freeform with the type of lessons I planned. At one point, I remember finishing a lesson about 20 minutes early, and the students convinced me to spend the rest of class teaching them swear words. So, yeah, that happened. I also remember talking to that class about funerals at one point. Fun fact, in Japan, since the country is so small and land is so expensive, they don't really have room to bury people like we do in the States. So most people are cremated when they die and my students asked me if it was different in the US. So I explained that sometimes people in America are cremated, but a lot of times people are just buried in graveyards. And the JTE seemed very concerned and asked, so they just put the dead people in the ground? And I said, uh, well, not like that. They usually put you in a nice box before lowering you into the ground but she still seemed a little concerned and just had this very grave look on her face, pardon the pun. And she asked, but, but what happens if it rains? And I replied, well, okay, they bury them a little deeper than that. And I know that kind of thing's a problem in like places that are below sea level, but whatever. But by far, one of my favorite conversations in that class was when the JTE approached me and asked, Star Sensei, can you explain what try hard means? And I said, oh, it kind of means that you're doing your best because you really want something. And she nodded and said, okay, okay. So what does hardly try mean? And I said, oh, well, that kind of means the opposite. It means you aren't really trying at all. And she nods again sagely and thinks for a moment before looking at me and saying, okay, okay, I understand. But one more question. What does die hard mean? <laughs> and I couldn't keep it together. I busted out laughing and said, well, that's the title of a movie about a guy who's trying very hard not to die, I guess. <laughs> she seemed to accept that answer, but those are the types of questions they sprang on me all the time. So good, God, I miss them. My teaching job was a lot. It was a lot of work and it could be really stressful at times. I definitely had plenty of bad days to go along with the good. But suffice to say, I loved my job. 
It was hard some days, sure, but it got easier with time, and once I had spent a full year there, I was able to start reusing my lesson plans, which made my job a lot easier. I loved my students. A lot of them were really quiet, and some of them could be pretty rowdy during class, but I was able to get to know a lot of them, and seeing them succeed made all the bad parts of my job worth it. This job was also what really helped solidify my love of teaching. Like I said in my previous video, I got my start teaching panels at anime conventions and other events, and getting to actually be a teacher in a classroom setting was kind of what made me want to start doing art tutorials. But I do miss classroom teaching a lot, and apparently I was pretty good at it. During my second year as an ALT, I had to get an evaluation by our prefecture's lead ALT, the one who worked with the Board of Education and ran workshops that taught teachers how to teach good. I was really nervous about the evaluation, but when we had our one-on-one -on -one afterwards, she told me that if I wasn't going to be leaving the coming summer, they would have offered me the position. Which was, like, really flattering, and maybe they were just saying that to be nice. I mean, I did my best as a teacher, but I never went to school for it or anything. But regardless, if they were serious and actually had offered me the job, I probably would have turned them down. While the promotion would have been cool, the best part of my job was getting to work with my students. I liked making lessons, I liked being a goofball up in front of my classes, and getting a laugh out of a class was genuinely a high point of my entire day. And now that I've been away from it for a while, I really do miss it. Part of what made me want to do this series was the fact that I keep getting nostalgic about my old teaching job. And maybe someday I'll try teaching some actual in-person art classes or something. But for right now, I'm content just yelling on YouTube and writing how-to books. Anyway, that about wraps it up for the teaching side of this series. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, if you're thinking about doing something like the JET program in the future, what country you'd want to teach in, or share some memories if you've also been a teacher abroad. I'll be doing a few more videos in this series in the future. For the next one, I'll be covering what living in Japan was like and telling some stories from my time there. That probably won't be my very next video, as I'm trying to spread out the theories a little bit, but keep your eyes open for it in the next few months. Lastly, once again, the art in the background is my webcomics July 2023 Mail Club merch. You can get this month's Patreon-exclusive printed stickers by supporting me and my webcomic on Patreon before the month is over. You'll also get a bunch of other benefits, like your name in the video credits, early access to comic pages, and more! Link for that is down in the description. So. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe if you haven't, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!